Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. Nobody uses Tumblr anymore, but anyway, it, it reposts there, so we're on Tumblr. Now, you can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week, you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. This is my first weekend without recording a podcast um, in a while, and... um and of course, I feel tremendously guilty about this. Even though I'm a couple of weeks ahead on the show, everything's good. Nonetheless, if I'm not actually recording, I feel as though um, something's wrong, I guess. But, you know, I'll deal. I'm off to Orlando for a trade show this week, and I don't think there are any pod prospects down there, so I'm not bringing my mics and gear, and I'm posting this show a day early. Um, our guest for this show, actually, is, we may as well dive right into it, Patrick McDonald the creator of the daily comic strip, Mutz. Now, I met Patrick in December at an event at Labyrinth Books in Princeton. Uh, He was going to interview Michael Tisserand, and they were going to discuss Michael's biography of George Harriman, uh, a book called Crazy, which I adored and uh, interviewed Michael about. Um, The thing is, though... I was really happy to to meet Patrick, too. See, I've been a fan of Mutt's and Patrick's work for more than 20 years. Um, in fact, when I was uh, just last night, I was going through uh, the, the long boxes in the um, comic section of our storage room, because there is such a thing. And I found two collections of Mutt's from 1995 and 1996 that I had bought. Um, I'm disappointed I didn't find them when I was going down to Patrick's place to record the podcast last week. But whatever. He he believes me. Um he knows I'm a fan for a, a long time. Um, the thing about Mutz is uh, it's a funny animal strip, and it's centering on a dog and cat called Earl and Mooch. But like Patrick says during the episode, they're not people disguised as animals. They're animals. And over more than 20 years, Patrick's combined his just gorgeous drawing style, a good head for gags, and a mission to, like, to open our minds, I guess, to to understand the, the lives of the animals that we're sharing this world with uh, and the responsibilities we have uh, toward them as people. Um, anyway, during the conversation you're about to hear, I say that Mutz is one of the best strips around, uh, particularly in the post-Calvin and Hobbes era. I think there are only two great comic strips in this time frame. Uh, one of them, unfortunately, uh, had to end very early, a, a strip called Cul-de-Sac. Luckily, Patrick's been at this for more than 20 years and, and keeps producing a wonderful daily strip. So it's something we should treasure while it's around. Um, in addition to all the other work that, that Patrick's done besides a daily strip, and I'm talking about children's books, collaborations with other writers, a musical adaptation of Mutz, um, Earl and Mooch are also featured on the animal-friendly license plates here in our home state of New Jersey. So if you're ever here um, and you see these two little cartoon cat and dog on a, a license plate, that's Patrick. Now, Patrick's latest book is a collaboration with the poet Daniel Ladinsky called Darling, I Love You, with the subtitle Poems from the Hearts of Our Glorious Mutts and All Our Animal Friends. It's published by Penguin, which... I guess, you know, counts as another animal friend. Uh, But anyway, Patrick has a few more books in the works, including a March release of the Mutt's Shelter Stories. And according to Amazon, this September, he'll have a children's book called The Little Red Cat Who Ran Away and Learned His ABCs the Hard Way, which sounds kind of interesting. 
Here's Patrick's bio from that new book with Daniel Ladinsky. There's a more extensive bio on his website, mutts.com. That's M-U-T-T-S. Patrick McDonnell is the creator of the comic strip Mutts, which debuted in 1994 and appears in over 700 newspapers in 22 countries. Mutts has been anthologized in 25 books in, in the United States and in numerous collections around the world. Patrick has created a dozen children's books, including the Caldecott Honor winning Me, Jane, a biography of Jane Goodall, and the New York Times bestselling The Gift of Nothing. He collaborated with Eckhart Tolle on Guardians of Being, spiritual teacher, sorry, spiritual teachings from our dogs and cats. He is a member of the board of directors of the Humane Society of the United States, the Fund for Animals, and the Charles M. Schultz Museum. And now, the Virtual Memory Show conversation with Patrick McDonald. So you've been doing mutts almost 25 years. Uh, 1994 you started. Yes, yeah, so was that 23 years? Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll say we're rounding towards a quarter century. Did you imagine it being something that had that lifespan to it? And how has it changed? How has your approach to it changed? And how has, has the work changed? You know, it's funny. I think uh, I went to a lot of things very naively. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a cartoonist since I was about four or five years old. I mean, I yeah. was in love with peanuts and a whole bunch of reasons why that's just what I wanted to do. And I never, never really thought about the reality of it's 365 days a year. And I mean, just mm -hmm. the reality of doing it. I just loved comics and yeah. thought I loved drawing. That'd be a fun thing to do. So, um, so, uh, yeah, reality hit me hard. Like a couple of months into this trip, it's like, Oh my God, I don't, I can't take a break. Yeah. <laughs> And the thought of doing it for 23 years, I, yeah, I didn't give that much thought. Um, but, you know, the history of comics is such a, especially in today's age, such a strange medium. I mean, you know, I mean, all the comics I loved did last for 30, 40 years. So, right. you know, I think... They had a I, glory run, but, you know, 23 yeah. years is not... Yeah, not look not I mean, I'm, I'm not even hitting 25 years yet, and Peanuts was 50. I'm <laughs> like, I'm not even half... Yeah. You know, when I think about not even being halfway <laughs> where he was... Um, so, uh, I guess, you know, not that I was hoping, you know, that my comic would last that long. I think I just kind of took it for granted because that was kind of the medium that if you did a comic and people liked it, it might be your whole life. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. How has the, the process of making it changed over that, that time? I mean, I, I'm thinking in terms both of how you've developed artistically as well as how the technology has, has changed from what it was in 1994. Yeah, well, um, that's another thing with comics. It's it, it's sort of like life. It just happens you know, yeah. day by day, and <laughs> there's no there's no secret plan. I I probably draw totally different than I drew when I first started, and I work different than when I first started. But it was never a conscious decision of yeah. uh, now, now I'm going to do this or now. I'm gonna but do did you that. notice a certain break at any time, or at uh, least a wow? That's how I used to do this. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, just you know, just looking at things. Um, You know, just the, the timing of it. I mean, obviously, when you do something for so long, I've, I've gotten a little faster at it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the first couple of years was, uh, man, it was, it was like, all I thought about was deadlines. I mean, yeah. it, it was, it was <laughs> it's a crazy job. And now I, now I am a little faster at it. Um, and, you know, it, it is art and commerce. I mean, I, it, there's a little yeah. factor. At this point, there's a little bit of a, not that this is bad, but there's a little bit of a factory feeling, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, I, I work the same way. I what I do is I sit down with my sketchbook. I, I work at this point, and it's changed over the years. But at this point, I do three weeks worth of strips in one batch. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first thing you do is sit down with your sketchbook, and uh, when I have three weeks worth of jokes, I stop. <laughs> I stop <laughs> thinking about jokes and get to work. And uh, and you know that's just well, it's just having a lot of faith. I mean, I, I just sit down and. It's really about getting out of the way. I guess with any artistic endeavor, it's about opening up and letting the universe in. I mean, it's tripping, as, as Sam Gross called it. Like, I think his Tuesdays are spent just lying on the floor thinking <laughs> up jokes. Wednesday is when he, he draws He's everything. I forget when Look yeah. Day falls into that. But, yeah, he, he has a schedule of the particular day that he sits down and or lies down and, and 
Let's yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have that tight a schedule, but when it's when it's time, I'll start thinking yeah. of jokes. I usually I used to do it always in my room, but now I actually go to a you know if the weather's nice, I'll go to a park and just sit in the park and, mm-hmm. and I just get away from everything and just let it happen. Um, you know, knock on wood. After a while, I usually have twenty one jokes that I think are good enough that we can start getting to work, and then that's when the factory happens. You know, then it's cutting the paper and penciling and inking and you know to, then it just becomes like there's you know 21 drawings on your table and you kind of do each one in that step at least that's the way i work now yeah what have you gotten better at i i well, it goes strictly from like a, a visual <laughs> or artistic sense as opposed to the more you know general work process and understanding the where the the jokes are coming from what have i gotten better at and are the things know. you regret about character design? Also, <laughs> I, I think only because I talked to David Boswell many years ago, before the podcast, uh, the guy who did Reed Fleming, World's yeah, Toughest yeah, Milk, sure, yeah. and says that if he knew he was going to actually draw this regularly, he would not have given him that nose because it's just <laughs> impossible to do that box nose from like all these different angles that he would have to draw him at. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if the word better. It, it's just different, you yeah. know. And um, and you know, it's funny as a a fan and a scholar of comic strips. I mean, I've, I've known it my whole life. I mean, you know, early peanuts doesn't look like late peanuts. Yeah. Crazy cat's a great example. I mean, I love both styles and I'm, I particularly lean to the really early stuff. I just love the energy of his early stuff, but the, you know, the, uh, the design and the feeling of the later stuff is totally different and, mm-hmm. and a great look too. Again, I doubt if he thought about that, it just happens. And I see it with my strip, you know, like, the early ones, I said, I don't know if I can draw like that anymore. Yeah. And I love them. I mean, it's funny. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, you, know, you know, it's funny. I, I had the pleasure of, uh, you know, the greatest thing about becoming a cartoonist is I got to become friends with my hero, Charles Schultz. And um, I think it was the 40th anniversary. They wanted to put a book out, and he asked me. He gave me the honor of. He said, "You you pick the strips for the for the book." Oh wow! Uh, so this was before uh, the internet and computers. And United Features literally mailed me 50, 40 years of Xerox. Oh my god! <laughs> I mean, it came in a box <laughs> the size of a refrigerator. Oh, wow. and that's how I had to do it. I sat down and you know put little X's next to the strips I liked the yeah. best. Um, but it's interesting if it was up to Sparky, cause he told me and he said he can't do it because the publisher said he couldn't, but he didn't want any of the early, he, he just cause the early ones look so. Yeah. He, he was like, Oh, I can't believe I didn't, you know, I didn't draw that right. And I, he, 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 he kind of yeah. had a, and to me, I love those early strips yeah. and I was happy that the publisher wanted to put them in there. But, uh, see, I, you know, it's funny. I look at my early stuff and it definitely, definitely looks different and maybe it's not technically as good, but. I kind of like how loose that yeah. that early stuff was. I have to admit, one of my all time favorites of yours uh, is actually from the first year. Mm-hmm. Um, it was 1994, uh, single panel all the way across of, of the living room with a little bit of the kitchen. Uh, old lady is on the phone talking to someone saying, "Small world, ha ha ha." And uh, in the foreground is the fish in his little tiny bowl, just yeah. saying, "Ha ha ha." Yeah. <laughs> Small world, yeah. <laughs> And I thought, wow, that guy gets it in a really, really <laughs> terrible way. But oh my god! But yeah, as far as drawing goes, it's not you know super you know Patrick McDonald y But you know, it's yeah, it's, no, it's, it's real. Uh, I didn't even use I didn't use any straight edge back then. I didn't like my doors. I freehand everything. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure why I made it. It's not a decision. But as I drew, you know, then I started using rulers in the strip. And it's funny when you someone should have figured this out. I'm not me though. But, I mean, if you look at comic strips that lasted a long time, and, uh, you know, uh, Peanuts and Crazy Cat, my two favorites, you know, the early stuff is, like, really loose and sketchy, and the characters are kind of thin. And then they kind of, maybe it's old age, yeah. but the characters definitely get stockier, you know, and, and mm-hmm. heavier. Yeah. And the and the backgrounds become starker and heavier. And I think it's true with Peanuts, too. I mean, if, if you look, you know, it becomes more designed, and maybe it's just that when you do something for so long, it it um it starts getting solid. But um, but I, and I see that with my work. I feel like the early stuff 
like the early crazy cat stuff. Not that I'm comparing myself to crazy cat, no, but just, was, just as a practitioner, yeah, has a, yeah. Yeah, has a little more looseness to it and a little free, more free freedom with it. And then it gets a little tighter. Not that it, that's a bad thing. It's just different. Yeah. It's again, the evolution as you get to know the characters better. I think I'd, I'd read in past interviews, you did not think of this as a strip that was going to have a cat along with the dog. Oh, you, yeah. you had it as the dog, <laughs> and the cat just shows up, and all of a sudden the cat and the dog are perfectly matched together, and you've got a different yeah. a different idea for the strip than you, you had well, you know, at the this, outset. This, this, I was a magazine illustrator who mm-hmm. wanted to be a cartoonist um, for 10 years before I did Mutt's. You know, when I, uh, when I graduated school, I had a portfolio because I took illustration at the School of Visual Arts, so I had an illustration portfolio, and I wanted to be a comic strip artist, but at that time, the comics, this was before Calvin and Hobbes and Far Side, and comics were kind of, you know, not More the most a, exciting place to yeah, be. You yeah. know, it was mostly comics that were 100 years old and weren't all that interesting. So even though I had the love of comics, I mean, mainly because of Peanuts and, you know, being a fan of Seagar and Windsor McKay and all those great comics, but that wasn't what was happening in the newspapers. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to also make a living, so I actually... You know, for better or worse, I actually got work as an illustrator, and that kept me busy for 10 years. And the whole 10 years, my poor wife had to hear me saying, yeah, I really should be doing a comic strip. And, you know, I think seeing Calvin and Hobbes and Farside actually make it in the paper, you know, all of a sudden it seemed like there was a little resurgence that, Mm -hmm. uh, you know. That the syndicates were willing to. Yeah, try something a little different. Mm -hmm. That There was a little more art back in the the, the comics. So finally I, I did try Mutz. But at that point, in my illustrations, I had a, I kind of, I, you know, it's funny, it was my little conceit in my illustrations that I was doing a comic strip because as many times as I could do a three panel illustration, even with words sometimes, you know, I mean, I, I was doing comic strips. I, um, my first job out of school was illustrating the Russell Baker column in the New York Times magazine, mm-hmm. which was every Sunday. Yeah. So I kind of had a, a, a weekly comic and they were totally okay with me doing a, three panels and four panels and telling my illustrating it comic strip style. Right. Um, you know, so I felt like I was having a comic strip in the comic list. But in this, in my illustrations, there was always a guy with a big nose and a mustache and a little white dog with a circle around his eye. And um, when I decided to try a comic strip, I thought that little dog, mm-hmm. you know, could be, a good comic and uh, mainly because after I was drawing this dog for years in my illustrations I always wanted a dog but my family we never had one and mainly because I was in love with Snoopy I wanted I wanted to have Snoopy in my life yeah. <laughs> and uh, I thought I was drawing a generic uh, dog but I was so an art director told me I was drawing a Jack Russell Terrier <laughs> little this, did you know <laughs> yeah well you know this was before Frasier so it was a pretty unknown breed at least for me so uh I looked him up and I said, wow, that looks just like my cartoon. So I, I went out and got a Jack Russell Terrier. His name was Earl. And, Who lived uh, to 19? He lived to 19 years what old. What were you feeding him? Or is, <laughs> is that normal for them? Or, or cause... They do live a long time, but that, that was a little extra long. Okay, and he was so also, the, I mean, the amazing thing too, he was really healthy until maybe the last month and a half of yeah. his life. So uh, he, he lived a good, good 19 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and his... Energy and joy was the real inspiration for Mutz. So, um, so I started out saying, okay, this, this illustration dog became a real dog and then a real dog became the cartoon. And, uh, so my sketchbook, I was thinking, okay, I, I was a little, I was thinking Little Orphan Annie, to tell you the truth. I, I liked the fact that Little Orphan Annie, you know, had her Daddy Warbucks, but she just went on crazy adventures and eventually would come back to Daddy Warbucks. So my original idea for Mutz was that, Earl had his Ozzy, the guy with the big nose and the mustache, but then he would go on adventures like Little Orphan Annie and eventually go back home at some point. Um, and in my sketchbook, I said, well, maybe there's a cat next door, and that, that would be good for a couple of days worth of jokes. Yeah. <laughs> and then just the way cats are, um, Mooch just took over the strip. And right. I didn't start out thinking it was going to be a dog and cat strip. Now, I've had... I didn't have a dog growing up, but we had a lot of cats. So, I mean, cats, I, you know, I loved cats. So it made sense to do a dog and cat strip. Um, and, you know, not thinking about it consciously when I did it, but, uh, you know, when I think about it now, it's, I mean, it's kind of like Snoopy and Crazy, you know, my two favorite yeah. characters, Jordan <laughs> Snoopy funny. and Crazy Cat. So did you imagine they would have the um, the flexibility, I guess, and that the strip would have the flexibility to, to sort of um, to be a vehicle for some of the topics that you've, 
you've addressed, particularly with you know animal rights, humane society stuff, et cetera. Did you feel you know starting out that you know this is a, a concept that can carry this stuff, or is that something I really want to get this into a comic and I pray to God the no, readers no, don't freak know, out? Again, yeah. comics are like life that you just grow with them. And um, you know, I started out this strip. I mean, I always loved animals. But I started out this strip trying to draw a funny animal strip. You know, yeah. I wanted to... Not know, an agenda, just funny animals. The yeah, I mean, the, the only agenda I think I did have was... Um, I didn't want to be the. I didn't want it to be the typical animal strip where they acted like humans. Right. You know, like most animal strips, you know, they're on computers and watch TV. And, you know, it was, they were animals, but they were really just humans in animal costumes. Mm -hmm. And because I really was trying to capture my own dog's spirit and the, and he was so funny, you know, I mean, yeah. people know if you have a dog and cat, they're funny. I mean, they got so much personality. I don't have to, you know, make them human. They have their own personality. So it was important to me. I did go into it thinking I want people to relate to their own dog and cat. So I, I mean, even though they speak English, you know, I, I was trying to keep them as dog like and cat like as possible. Um, and then you know, trying to see the world through their eyes, you know, what's their life like. And, and it, it suited me fine because you know, I'm a less is more guy and kind of a Zen attitude towards life. And you know, I was totally happy doing strips about things that are important to my dog, which basically was food and the yeah. weather, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, for very simple topics yeah. to make jokes about. Um, and then again, it just grew. I mean, seeing the world through their eyes, I started thinking about all the dogs and cats that didn't have it as nice as yeah. my dog and cat and in my strip and in my life. Uh, so I first started thinking about how could I talk about shelters and mutts. And um, at the same time that I was doing these little sketches of shelter dogs, uh, the Humane Society contacted me and said um, that the first week of November was National Animal Shelter Appreciation Week and maybe I can mention it. And I thought, that's, that's perfect. I, yeah. you know, I have strips ready to go. So that started that, and then you know, over the years I became more conscious of um, you know, how tough animals do have it on the planet, and if there's a way I could you know, I'd be a voice for the voiceless. So uh, you know, slowly, I, I mean, at the same time trying to make it entertaining, I didn't yeah. want it just to become a preachy comic strip, but I thought I had the opportunity to do that. And, and, uh, yeah, are you able to recognize when that's starting to veer? You know, when you're... Um when the message is getting to, you know, non-comic strip? Yeah, well, it's, it's a, you know, you you, um, you walk on a tightrope with yeah. that. You know, um, they're all important to me. And, um, you know, how you tell it. What, what, you know, what's really nice about the medium I'm in is um, people, well, today they get it on the computer, but back, <laughs> back yeah. in the day, you, you know, you read your morning paper. And it's, it's the characters that come into your life every day. So, I mean, you, you treat them like family. I mean, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the reason Charlie Brown and Snoopy are so well loved, they were just like part of your family, you know, the part of the, you know, morning table discussion or, you know, so I think you're open to those characters. And because it is like family, I think you can bring up topics like these animal issues I bring up once in a while because it's coming from a kind of friendly place and yeah. I try to keep it friendly, you know, um, so it's walking that tightrope of talking about things that are pretty powerful, but um, you know, keep it simple and, and have understandable. An audience, yeah, an audience and relate to it. You know, for all yeah. I mean, for all the things I've done, I, I haven't really gotten any letters where people complain about that. If anything, I get letters people happy. You know, yeah. we were talking earlier about you know, I did a strip about um, greyhound rescue. You know, from the racetracks and stuff and. God, we, that's like one of the most popular strips. Yeah, it's one of the weirdest breeds of dogs. That I always have to explain <laughs> to people that yeah, no, they don't need to run all the time. They actually don't want to run at all. They're really you know couch potatoes who are uh -huh. seventy five to eighty pounds. But um, actually, I want to get back to when you mentioned being an illustrator for about ten years before mm -hmm. getting to the comic, or getting uh, mutts and then having your first strip. It reminds me in some ways of Richard Thompson, the, the yeah. late Richard Thompson, uh, a wonderful cartoonist who made the great comic Cul-de-Sac. Uh, if anything, I consider Mutz and Cul-de-Sac to be the two great post-Calvin and Hobbes. His strip was amazing, yeah. just amazing. 
I mean, as good as anything, you know, yeah. right up there with all the greats. That's the thing. And you look at, you know, the landscape yeah. isn't much greater than it was when you were, you were talking about yeah. the 80s period. But, but <laughs> both, and we did have, we did have a similar, I mean, he was, that's what I wonder. Both of you were illustrators. Yeah. For a long around time the same, this. around the same time we were doing illustrations for the longest time. Yeah. What do you think that had? I, I don't know if you'd ever spoken to him about this, but uh, do you feel, what, what impact do you think it had working as an illustrator for years before moving into a comic strip? Oh, without a doubt, it was, um, it was like, you know, doing the minor leagues yeah. <laughs> and mainly, you know, again, uh, you know, the deadline's crazy, but as an illustrator, you know, you, you're used to deadlines. Yeah. And, it sort and of prepared working. you for certain aspects. Yeah. Of, and also the thinking aspect, you know, you would get a story and you know, at least the way I worked, I would, you know, give like 10 or 12 different ideas to the magazines, you know, sketches of what, mm-hmm. what I could do. And then they would pick one. So my brain already was constantly thinking and as many jokes as I, you know, I would never just give a mag, you know, if they gave me a story, I would never just go back with one sketch and say, here it is. I'd give them like six or seven, you know, I, I as many ideas as I could think yeah. of, I would give them. So that was really helpful for just being able to come up with visual ideas, you know, mm-hmm. fast. Cause that's basically what you have to yeah. do when you're a cartoonist. <laughs> I'll tell you something about Richard. A friend of his told me something recently, which I really feel bad about Uh-oh. that, um, you know, I didn't start much until I was, uh, 38 1994 so you would have been yeah i think 38 pretty old and uh no you were you were ripening yeah i was right um but what i felt bad about is a friend of richard's told me recently that uh you know richard was doing the comic strip for a while and he was always thinking about maybe making that comic strip but he used me as an example like well i don't have to do it right away i can wait a while so (laughs) you can blame me for richard not doing cul-de-sac 20 years earlier (laughs) yeah it's all your fault mcdonald (laughs) My Richard Thompson story, which I got to share with his wife uh, last year at a, a tribute thing, um, he'd already been diagnosed with Parkinson's. It was already progressing. I had just started doing this a few months earlier and thought, you know, I better ask him just in case he's, you know, able to, you know, I'd love to, to record with him. Um, I've got a trip down to D.C. for my day job. You know, I'll do that. So I pitch him. You know, he's on board, says, you know, yeah, you know, just you know, my health is up and down. So, you know, don't. Be yeah, surprised yeah. if I have to tell you a few days beforehand you know, that I can't. I said, please, don't don't worry. You have Parkinson's. I'm just some guy from New Jersey. Um, two days before, he writes me, Gil, I'm so sorry, but you know, I've gotten worse. My voice sounds like what I imagine a mosquito hitting puberty sounds <laughs> like. So I just I can't do it. But is it okay if I have my friend Matt come instead to, to record with you? I look up Matt worker who is at that point the uh reigning pulitzer prize winner for wow. political cartooning i'm like yeah <laughs> a that would be fine b richard you don't owe me anything <laughs> You're, you, you have this horrible disease i'm just some guy but that was a sign of of you know how he giving this guy was guy. and he was sitting yeah. there trying to fix things up yeah. for me i'm like yeah. i'm not the guy you need to worry about so uh, but i did tell his wife that story and she, yeah, yeah that was my richard. husband he yeah. he would keep giving like that so um but as far as uh, let me ask though the illustration versus strips versus books some of your stuff has been adapted for stage but i don't know how involved you've been in oh in, I, I wrote I, you did write, write it, okay yeah. how do those modes of work differ for you and how do you make sure the strip is still <laughs> you know being produced um, um, when you have these other projects because you've done about a dozen books at this point in varying, in I mean, I, a dozen picture books, non, yeah, yeah, non, yeah, non yeah, collections of, yeah, yeah, of yeah probably at least a dozen. Yeah, um, well, I tell you, I don't get out of the house much. That's for sure. It's a great house, though. So, you <laughs> oh know, yeah, you're, you're excused. Well, but yeah. you know, I figured if I was going to be in a house all the time, we would. We, it took us seven years to find this house, but I'm really happy we got it. Um, it's one of the nicer cartoonist homes. I've, <laughs> I won't say any details about it, but one of the nicer cartoonist homes I've ever been to. So. Well, I don't leave it often, so yeah. Um, well, you know, they're all, they all have their own. I really enjoy all of them. I mean, I, I don't do, I don't really do illustrations anymore. Mm-hmm. Actually, I feel like I'm responsible for killing all these art forms. <laughs> I, I, I stopped illustrating, you know, to do. I pretty much stopped illustrating to do much because I didn't have the time to do much. And then, pretty much magazine illustration. You you can't make a living doing that anymore. <laughs> and then I did the comic strip, and then you know. 
maybe 10 years into the comic strip, newspapers started disappearing. So I wouldn't yeah. tell anyone to become a newspaper cartoonist yeah. anymore. Um, you know, I'm doing picture books now and I don't know. I'm hoping that, yeah. I'm hoping that stays healthy. <laughs> you don't burn that I'm hoping that stays healthy. And we're actually, um, we're in the, working on a, a Mutz movie and I'm sure movies are going to disappear by yeah. the time it comes out. <laughs> If it comes out, it's like sorry, when we're doing everything out. directly to brain now. There's, there's no longer a movie theater, but um, each, each one's different. I mean, illustration. I really, other than like Mutz illustrations and covers and things like that, I don't really do illustration anymore. Uh, the strip is like, you know, the thing that feeds everything. You know, it's mm -hmm. just I have to do that. And, yeah, you know, it's and it keeps me pretty busy. But I love to. My favorite thing to do is the picture books. I really love uh, doing that. And, and what's nice about that, I mean, it's still telling stories with words and pictures. I mean, basically, that's what I do. But the picture books are fun just because they're more experimental and they're more open. You know, when when you do a comic strip, I mean, it's always the same size, the right. same style, you know, and the same characters. So I really love doing the picture books because I start each one. I don't know what I'm going to do, who's who's going to be in it, how, even what medium I'm going to, you know, whether it's going to be watercolor or brush or pen and ink or... So I really enjoy doing the, the picture books. They're they're a lot of fun, and uh, and working on the play was great. God, it was like the best experience I ever had. I, the Kennedy Center in D.C. asked me to do the Gift of Nothing, which was my first picture book mm -hmm. that starred the Mutz characters, Earl and Mooch. And it was a musical for kids. It was in their children's theater, and it was just the greatest experience because you know i mean as a cartoonist i pretty much work at home by myself and my dog is my audience and my yeah. company <laughs> is this <laughs> funny yeah, <laughs> exactly um but boy just doing something that collaborative yeah well, uh, was that difficult for you it, no it, I was there any it. part of it that you had I, well to, you know i had geniuses yeah, i had, well. a, I had a, a great director aaron posner and uh the guy who wrote the music um andy min so i mean it was just fun to work with people who really knew, you know, were really great at what they do and helped me along. Uh, the three of us pretty much wrote it together. And uh, I was there. God, I, it was in D.C. I was spending a lot. It was, I was, yeah, I was a rough time because, you know, time is the most important thing for cartoonists. Yeah. So I was spending a lot of time in D.C. away from my drawing table, but it was just so much fun. And I, it was so great to see. Are you able to draw anywhere but the... Able to draw the comic anywhere, but but the drawing. You know, I don't. I know some cartoonists do. Actually, it's funny. The you know, I'm a member of the National Cartoonist Society, and I became a member when I didn't do much. It was before I did much. I actually uh, was a magazine illustrator, and at a Sports Illustrated party, Arnie Roth uh, came up to me and said, "You should be a member of the National Cartoonist Society." And I, I told him, "I said I took it for granted you needed a comic strip to do that." And he goes, "Nah, if you do funny illustrations, they'll." you could be a member yeah. so of course i joined because you know at that time i was still dying to be a cartoonist and just wanted to be around comic strip people so um so i became a member and uh the first award dinner i went to was in washington dc and i met mike peters in the lobby mm -hmm. and we were having a great conversation and his wife came up to him and said mike you got to go up and draw and it was like a Saturday night, and it was for the night of the Rubens. Sorry. <laughs> and he walked away, and I said, wow. And I had no idea that was my future. <laughs> I should have, that was a warning sign. God yeah. God presented me a warning sign, which you I didn't, didn't take listen. at all. You know, let me ask, considering uh, genres and art forms that you've destroyed, uh, had, you ever, <laughs> <laughs> had you ever thought of being a comic book artist? I know you've got a, a Jack Kirby. I've seen a few of the Kirbys that you've, you've got here, and I know there's a superhero background for you. Had that ever been a, an area that you... You know, it's funny. It. I would, I, I mean, like any kid, especially when I grew up, I mean, Kirby and Ditko were drawing comics when I was really young. Um, I mean, I loved com superhero comics. Yeah. And as a kid, and even to this day, I'll still sketch a superhero yeah. just when I'm sketching. But, uh, you know, I, I leaned towards the, uh, you know, Peanuts and Creed, the, the funnier, sillier, yeah. simpler things. I and mean, even though I totally am a guy, I love Jack Kirby and totally admire his outlooks and his cosmic, uh, the way he tells stories and everything. And I'm sure somewhere in there, I'm in, you know, there's some influence that comes out in much somewhere. I'm not sure where, but I, I never had the desire to, um, to, to go to, to, to go the superhero. Okay. That's yeah. what I'd wondered and as you, know, you were developing. And as in an general, artist. I'm not a, 
that's funny. I'm not really a story guy. I, I mean, one of the things that appeals to me about comic strips is how sh- short. I mean, they're mm-hmm. I, they're more poetic. I yeah. think I think I lean towards poetry. Um, I like things that are short and sweet and simple. Yeah. Even when you extend the narrative for you know a yeah, week yeah. or two, it's still yeah. You know, it, it's I mean, and it's totally I like these little poetic I like, blocks. I too. like three panels, you know, yeah. or one panel. I did. Yeah. I, I'm long. Long stories. I love reading them and looking at them, but I don't know. If... Yeah. And that's why the the play was interesting because the theater and comic strips are pretty closely linked because it, it's yeah. intimate, and you don't need big stories or big actions. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I found writing the play close to me. I mean, even though it was a ninety minute play and it had to be a ninety minute story. It still is just like little vignettes and moments that you can do in plays. Not the same as movies. I'm work, I I wrote the script for the Mutz movie, um, and that was that was a really learning experience because yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah, because you know that that you do need a story, and I think mm-hmm. that's why God, well, you see now are comic superhero book adaptations movie, yeah. because they're this. It's the same medium. It's action and it's wild stories and complicated plots or whatever, and, and comic strips aren't that. So it was really interesting to keep the spirit of Mutz and that feeling of Mutz in a ninety-minute kind of action, yeah. you know, action movie. So uh, did you have to keep writing in pauses where, where <laughs> Ernest and Mooch are just kind of looking <laughs> off into the distance about something? Uh, yeah, no, but I, I I think I did it. And if all goes well, it'll it'll be made and people will enjoy it. But it was a, a different experience. Where the theater, I didn't have that same problem. The theater. I, was a little more comic strippy mm-hmm. in terms of, and I guess the you know throughout history, I mean Annie and Little Abner, I mean a lot of comic strips have been successful yeah. plays, but maybe that's the reason they they just they're closer in spirit. And you had some seriously creative people yeah. behind the strips <laughs> and and the the, the play side. Um, you've mentioned Crazy Cat a bunch of times, and mm-hmm. I know um, you you helped put together one of the first monographs on George Harriman's work uh, back in the eighties. Do you have a Coconino County? <laughs> or is is New Jersey your Coconino? Yeah, I always say much. I never say it. I never, I never in the strip said what town they live in or where they live. But in my head, uh, it's always an, a little uh, idealized, dreamy New Jersey of my youth. Mm-hmm. I think you know, um, you know, just little suburban towns, the big city looming in the background, yeah. New York. Um, and they go down the shore every summer, so right. I mean, it's, that's just a Jersey thing to do. Mm-hmm. So it is like a, you know, uh, my uh, corny version of New Jersey. Yeah. Had you ever lived anywhere else in general? Uh, Manhattan. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. You never moved anywhere beyond <laughs> no, no, a, no, a basically I'm a thirty-five mile yeah, line East from Coast. Because okay. yeah. <laughs> I live in the house I grew up in, uh, uh, in, in New- and in fact the. The road out of our town, Skyline Drive, is two roads out of town. Uh, Skyline Drive is about 20 miles away from the New York skyline, which you can see so you in almost its entirety. Yeah. yeah, as you go over, it's the up there is the almost all of the city, and that's always been my my you know distant yeah, yeah. focal point. <laughs> um, but and, yeah. I, and I lived in Hoboken for a while, so I had the same skyline. Yeah, but I, I, that's the thing. I'd wondered if there was a um, something that informs geographically, or again uh, spiritually, if it's that you know that sense of a quiet New Jersey suburb where, yeah. you know, there's the woods. I, I will show you a picture uh, after we finish up of the bear who wanders through our yard every so often. I guess you don't get that down here. Um, the deer, I'm sure you probably yeah, still... Yeah, we, we still have the deer. And we're, yeah. when I grew, the town I grew up in, we, you know, um, like two blocks from my house, there was woods where we used to see turtles and catch frogs and things yeah. like that. So it's it's a little combination of my youth, I suppose. Right. That's one of those, uh, will we try and explain the stereotype of New Jersey to the reality of, of what we have? It's, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, it's not the Jersey Shore and it's not an industrial wasteland. There's actually, <laughs> you know, a couple of really nice areas. Trust us, you know. Um, actually, let me ask, the, the, um, the whole drawing on computer mm-hmm. thing, has that ever appealed to you or is it something you've tried at all? Has the technology, you know, is that something you do now? Um, you know, I'm... I'm- I'm the least computer guy. <laughs> yeah, know. I didn't notice anything when we walked no, around your house earlier. So no, you know, I, I, was... I still dip a pen into a bottle of ink. Yeah. Um, I don't even own a computer. I mean, I have a, a phone and a, a uh, an iPad that I use once in a while, but uh, I'm, I'm okay. pretty uh, <laughs> I, I thought that was the fi. case. It only occurred to me walking through. I'm like, wait, I just his 
studio doesn't have anything with a plug. Okay, that's that's you know. Yeah, no, I'm pretty low-fi, but you know, I have to be honest. I I mean, I'm thinking about it. We we went to um, at the cartoonist event this year, so the Cintiq people were at the last Ruben Awards, and uh, we got to fool around with that, and I got to meet the guys who who make them, and I'm I'm definitely going to give it a try. Yeah. Um, not that I'm tech. But what I did like about it was the immediacy of it. There, you know, it yeah, felt apparently like, the the texture and everything. It's really yeah, it feels improved. like it feels like sketching, and I I like the speed of it. So I there's, I'm I'm gonna at least play with it and see what yeah. happens. Yeah, it was a weird thing for me seeing uh, when I interviewed Liza Donnelly. Um, that you know afterwards she was live drawing me on her iPad uh, when I was interviewing her <laughs> husband. It was yeah. just one of those like okay, she's <laughs> sitting on the floor there, just kind of you know playing with an iPad, and all of a sudden there was this drawing yeah. of the two of us that was yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to give that a try for the. I'm going to try it. I think with the comic strip and see what happens. Mm-hmm. I think for the children books, I I like the tactile paper yeah. and watercolor and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Is there a particular strip you're proudest of? Yeah, there was one I did a while back, and this goes back to the animal issues. But I, I did a strip that I call Sweet Dreams. And in the first panel, uh, Millie is petting her cat Mooch and saying Sweet Dreams, and he's on his little cat bed in a warm house. Mm-hmm. And then the next panel, you see a chicken in a cage dreaming of running free. And then the next panel, you see an elephant at the circus, chained, dreaming of running free. And then you see a chimp in a lab, dreaming of running free. And a pig in a gestation crate, dreaming of running free. And then in the last panel, um, Guard Dog, who's the chained dog in the backyard, is dreaming of being on a bed and someone patting his head and saying sweet dreams. Which, um, you know, obviously a little on the sad side. Yeah, but but yeah. the thing that recently i am which is really great. I mean, for all the bad news in the world, um, you know, I did that in the year 2000. Mm. And here in 2017, I mean, all those things I drew are are starting to disappear, which I didn't think would be true in 2000. But, you know, there's no more elephants in this ring and blow the circus. I mean, that's amazing. I will say with the the lab thing, I used to be the editor of a trade magazine in the pharmaceutical sector. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want animal experimentation. Like their whole thing was, if we could do this on the computer and model it, we They'd wouldn't happy, need yeah. to do this. And, they, and they've made great advances in being able to, to do more modeling, get rid of, not get rid of, stop having to, to breed, you know, both mm-hmm. the mice and the, the primates yeah. and everything else that they're using. But, but yeah, it's, you know, that's got to feel pretty good though to see yeah, no, know, I mean, the world changing like that. Yeah. That those were all major problems and they're all being addressed. And I just think, yeah, I know we got a long way to go, but I think, you know, consciousness is being raised a little bit about animals and how we treat them. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned Charles Schultz also as the other, uh, b- besides uh, George Harriman and Crazy Cat, as as major influences um, on you. You've gotten to meet, or you got to meet Charles Schultz, um, and he actually gave you one of the greatest blurbs um, <laughs> of all time. Were there other cartooning legends that you got to meet as you were coming up and, and other guys that you looked up to with just a, holy crap, thank God, I, I, you know, or at least this person actually knows who I am. Oh, this is fantastic. Or pretty much a Charles Schultz kind of eclipse everybody well, yeah, else in those terms. It's, it's, you know? it's really hard to top Charles Schultz. I wouldn't and, say top, but is, is anyone else, you know. In, in and, you know, my, my all my other uh, favorites and great heroes have been gone a yeah, long, long time. Windsor I mean, McKay is you know, I got to meet back. George Herman's granddaughter. Mm. Uh, Seagar, all those people have, have been long gone. But some, I mean, I, you know, I, I did get to meet Jack Kirby uh, twice. I used to go to comic conventions when I was a yeah. young kid, and, and to, to see Jack Kirby with his cigar in his mouth and shake his hand was—I <laughs> will I'll never forget that. Um, you know, the other person is uh, Jules Pfeiffer. Yeah, yeah, I, I got to got to meet and get to know Jules Pfeiffer, who just amazing. Uh, you know. Um, my mom and dad met at Cooper Union Art School, mm-hmm. and growing up, you know, art was encouraged, and my mom and dad had a lot of art books in the house, and the two I remember, and these are like some of my earliest memories, this is, you know, like, you know, being a two-year-old, was uh, her Pogo collection yeah. and her Jules Pfeiffer collection, and, you know, as a 
little kid. I, I, I couldn't even read, but I was just mesmerized about those the cal- sweep of those lines. Oh my god, the, the lines that how those characters were alive. I mean, it, they were just little black and white drawings, and they were like alive on the page. And I used to pour over those things. So, wow. um, one of the nicest things when I first met Jules, I uh, I bought my mother's copy of one of his early oh. books, and he drew a little dancer for my mom. And that was the story of when I met him at the small press expo. Um, basically drew Friedman shoved me into a room <laughs> with, with him, Linda Barry, Tom tomorrow and Warren who, who runs the small press expo. And I just, uh, drew said, I just pick up a bagel and some locks, you know, and I ate this sat in the corner and, and sat down and Jules sat down next to me to ask who I am, you know, what do I do, et cetera. And so I pitched him on the show, but What's funny is, you know, we're we're sitting there kind of shooting the breeze, and then uh, Linda says, um, "Jules, do you mind signing something for me?" And takes out, you know, some long held Jules Pfeiffer <laughs> book. At which point, Tom Tomorrow and Warren both start lunching for their their bags, also because they also have tons of stuff they want <laughs> Jules to sign. And it was just a question of who was going to break the ice first, because it's. I, I liken it to a story uh, from late in Michael Jordan's career when some guy an opposing shooting guard, you know, kind of chest bumped in front of him that he, he, you know, Trump Jordan. And Jordan said to him, you're wearing my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a moment of like, kid, I know that's nice, but you're wearing Air Jordans right now. <laughs> Think about what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, all these guys, to see that level of reverence uh, towards Jules. Uh, there's a picture of, of uh, Linda shooting a selfie with him. You know, it, it's, you know. Uh, Jules, Jules is another hero. I mean, uh, he's very inspiring to me. I mean, before I even met him, I mean, I just loved his work. And I, especially again, the poetry of his work and the, yeah. you know, the, the poetry in his line, you know, the, the looseness of that. And boy, I remember he opened the world to me because I saw a show that had a few of his originals and they were paste ups all over the place that, yeah. you know, he would sketch something and then yeah. paste it on. And I never thought of doing that because yeah. I was used to looking at, um, God, you look at Crazy Cat Originals or Peanuts. Or, there's not even white out on those things. They're really? like perfect. Like, how, how could someone do yeah. that? And then Jules Pfeiffer's, you could tell they were like little cut and paste jobs. And I was like, oh, I can give myself the liberty to cut and paste and just, you know, be looser. Um, I, I, the first time that occurred to me was uh, not in, in visual art, but listening to demos of either the Beatles or an Elvis Costello song and realizing... Oh, it's not perfect <laughs> right out of the box. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you can make mistakes and, you know, try out different things. And yeah, I trust me. I was a slow learner. All things considered. Well, you know, I, yeah. I love those mistakes. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah, I love people's sketches and I didn't, so anyone's work, you know, Percy Crosby, Jules Pfeiffer, I mean, work that looks that immediate just mm-hmm. really appeals to me. Um, you know, it's funny. It, it, I think my early mutt strips had that more immediate feeling as I've, do it more, it becomes a little more um, not as immediate for whatever reason. But my picture books, I I don't pencil or do anything. I just I just go draw. right into yeah, that. I do the paste the paste up the Jules Pfeiffer paste up with those, <laughs> and just let them happen and let them have that that feeling. You know, it's funny. I once uh, I once do you know the illustrator Elwood Smith? No, no, I don't. Yeah, he, he's, he was Looking an illustrator up. when I was an illustrator, and. Uh, he had a very, he had a very uh, cartoony style, you know, Bigfoot cartoony, uh, like uh, Billy DeBeck. He had like a Billy DeBeck look in his illustrations. But when anyway, I went to visit him once, and we were going to trade illustrations, you know, which illustrators used to do. And I went to his house, and he had a million framed illustrations throughout his house. And I looked by his phone, and he had a big pad by his phone that was just filled with a million doodles, and I said, that's what I want. <laughs> and he traded me. He, he said he had, he had to copy some of the phone numbers down. Yeah. But uh, he gave me that, and I, I just loved it, because, you know, again, it was just that you know, fast, yeah. not-thinking art. Yeah, it's like when uh, uh, that Dutch publisher put out uh, Chris Ware's sketchbooks, Yeah, and you realize that, oh, yeah, Chris Ware isn't drawing these <laughs> these perfect geometric yeah. things he actually has to draw like anybody else that's that's again slow learner uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not you know quite quite up to speed with that stuff but were your parents um happy with the the comic with mutts i shouldn't ask about parents i always, no, no, I always no. okay no, you, how, no. how do they feel about you becoming a professional cartoonist <laughs> well, unfortunately they're both gone right now but uh no i think no one could have gotten a bigger kick out of it because you know like they they met at cooper union art school um but you know uh 
they got married and had kids and got real jobs. And, yeah. you know, even though art was still in their lives, you know, my mom actually ended up becoming a teacher and taught art and uh, design. And, um, but, you know, my dad didn't become an artist, but always sketched, you know, those napkins mm -hmm. and actually <laughs> have a lot of his, he did, he, for whatever reason, we had paper plates and he, at the middle of the night, he would draw on paper plates. <laughs> so we have my dad's paper plate art. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, no, they couldn't have been more thrilled that, you yeah. know. They got that, to appreciate some of yeah, your success. that I got that, to, that, that. you know, do what was one of their dreams. And how important that they were so, um, you know, that they were uh, so proactive in me doing that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, all my friends growing up were either artists or musicians. And it really helps to have the encouragement of your parents that you could actually do that for a living. Because mm -hmm. most of them didn't become musicians or right. artists, you know. Uh, you know, but I think I had the benefit of having a mom and dad that thought it would be cool if I became, you know, they weren't terrified <laughs> that I might become an artist. Although they had their moments to worry about. I'm me. sure. Well, yeah, you're always going to with the, yeah. oh my God, I wish you would become a plumber. I, yeah. would, I just, um, the, the one that's, the episode going up this week is with Philip Lopate. A uh, great essayist. His, his brother is Leonard Lopate. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, Philip is a, a basically the greatest personal essayist around. Um, his daughter just went into, she just graduated from college and she's working in publicity at Harper. And I said to him, you know, so your, your daughter's just gone into publishing, uh, after finishing college. Do you feel you let her down? You know, is, is there a degree that which, you know, you, you really regret that you pushed her into the family trade? He's like, I wish she learned to be a plumber or an electrician, but you know, if this is the way it's going to go, she's going to follow in the family business, I guess. So, uh, but let me ask you, you also, in addition to, as we went through that, that litany of illustration, comic strips, and the other forms you've worked in, um, you're also a painter. Well, you, you know, uh, but, but you, you paint. I you know, paint. We're, we're, we're in your art studio right now and not yeah. your drawing room. So that means you're taking this somewhat seriously because you actually have, you know, yeah, a I love it. For it's, it. Well, you know, I don't really take vacations. So this, this is my vacation. I, I go to my studio and paint and I paint. It's kind of the, you know, it's kind of the exact opposite of what I do all day. You know, I, I drove, if you ever seen a Mutt's original, I drew really small. I was, mm -hmm. you know, it goes back to being a kid, and I kind of took it for granted those comic books and those comic strips were kind of <laughs> drawn the size they were in the paper. Yeah, not, realizing yeah, not realizing it was not realizing they, yeah, right. that they shrink them down. Yeah. So as a kid, I always drew small, and I just, it just stayed with me. So, you know, my Mutt's comic strips are, the originals are, you know, God, when you look at a Peanuts original, I think mine can fit in one panel of uh, <laughs> Charles Jones's <laughs> Peanuts. But, uh, I hope they don't so commission I, postage stamps. I'm just <laughs> kidding. Go, go, go. <laughs> but uh, so I come out to my studio and I do giant sloppy abstract paintings. And uh, I, I've always, I mean, I'm a, I just love it. When I, when I went to school, even though I illustrate, I majored in illustration, I took as many painting and fine art classes as I can because that appealed to me too. And I used to, before I did mutts, when I was just an illustrator, I used to do big abstract paintings and then when I did months it kept me kind of busy and busy and I haven't painted in a while but just in the last two years I started painting again mm -hmm. and really enjoy it where it's going to go I don't know it's I just do it for the fun of it it's what art is there for <laughs> yeah partly so, who are your we'll say influences in as, far as, as far as painting yeah God, my influence well people like you know I, I was lucky work do you dig I was lucky I, I grew up in I grew up in I was in New York during uh like the new wave scene, so Basquiat. I mean, I got to go to all the Basquiat's early shows, and I, I mean, and it was an exciting time too because, um, you know, a lot of the painters back then were doing comic imagery. You know, Basquiat yeah. in particular. I mean, Basquiat did a couple of crazy cat images with Crazy Cat in it. Um, you know, and Keith Haring was cartoony, and um, Kenny Scharf, and uh, I love Donald Batchelor. Donald Batchelor has a really nice cartoony sensibilities to his paintings. So those guys during that are really excited me. But as far as painters go, my, my favorite painter is Cy Twombly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Cy Twombly, Motherwell, de Kooning, all, all the, I don't look at any <laughs> abstract art. Yeah, that that post-war thing you've got there? Yeah, that's, that's... yeah those, those painters. And then, I mean, Monet and Van Gogh, all the classics. Uh, yeah, I'm really lucky right over here. There's a great art museum that I could walk to and I go I sometimes I work on comic strips in the art museum. Yeah. 
I have to send my brother out here also because there's a uh, Springsteen photographic yeah, yeah. Thing across the street, and he's well from New Jersey, so you know uh, that's kind of his, his. That's funny. Michael Tisserin was here for the Crazy Cat. Yeah, you and that was the first place he wanted to go to see the Bruce Springsteen. Nice. Photographs. I, I hadn't noticed it. We were walking down here. We parked over at Palmer Square and walked because. Oh, okay. This will lead up to the the horrible question I have to ask, but uh, since you know we had to say goodbye to our dog two months ago, Amy and I try to make sure we do as much walking as we can because yeah, yeah that was sort of Rufus T. Firefly was the reason we got out <laughs> walking all the time. You so. know, in, in this world, people don't walk. I mean, usually the only people you see out walking are other people with dogs. Yeah, and that was uh, people. St- our neighborhood they started to oh god, there goes those two people who I've never gotten their names of, but they don't have their dog with them anymore, and <laughs> yeah. that that led to the yeah, the awful yeah. question. In fact, let me ask the question now: um, How long? Well, we had to say goodbye to our dog in a very early December, about a week after Thanksgiving. We'd had him about nine years. What sort of gap do you uh, <laughs> do, do you think is is either appropriate or you know? Yeah, uh, I guess best it's up. For, to, you know, yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. I guess it's up to the individual. For me. You know, my Jack Russell Earl, who was the inspiration for this trip, uh, lived for 19 years. We were yeah. we were really blessed. And uh, when he passed away, it took me a year and a half. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife probably within a couple of days was on Pet Finder trying to find a new Jack for me. Yeah. But I, I, I just wasn't ready. Um, so for me, it took about a year and a half. And uh, boy, as soon as I got our new dog, Amelie, I think the first thing out of my mouth was, why the hell did I wait a year and a <laughs> half to get a dog? So I, I would recommend, uh, you know, do what feels right. But uh, as soon as you feel like it, it might be time, you might as well do yeah. it. You won't regret it. <laughs> yeah, we've been on the, the, the Greyhound group that we belong to. We keep going through the, uh, yeah, that one maybe, uh, you know, we, we should start thinking about it. We kept going with the um, not during winter because, you know, yeah, you don't yeah. want to. And then we discovered Thanks to climate change, we don't have to deal with snow here in New Jersey ever again. <laughs> so, you know, it's a different world than we, we thought. But, you know, now I'll tell you, with cats, um, our cat passed away in January. Mm-hmm. And I knew I had a book coming out in October called Tech. And they were going to, I haven't done a book tour in a while, but I was going to go on a book tour in October. So I told my wife, you know, just to make life simpler, let's not get another cat until after the book tour, mm-hmm. which was starting October 1st. So uh, darn if like the last days of September, a feral cat appeared in up. our backyard. And of course we caught him and, you know, uh, took him to the vet. And uh, now he's our cat. Of course, took the week I was yeah. going on the book tour. <laughs> and he's, he's a great cat. Yeah, I had the... Well, I've got business travel. I've got this. I've got that. But those are all just excuses you, yeah, you, yeah. you put up there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, perhaps next time you see me, there will be this greyhound <laughs> bring, wandering bring, bring next him. to me. You know, yeah, that that was the other thing. I thought, you know, of all guests I've I've interviewed, you know, this is one who would probably be fine with my showing up with a yeah, greyhound sure. or two wandering into the house. So you know, but um, yeah, that's that's. My wife volunteers at an animal shelter in in uh, the next town fair. over, and uh, she's. A little like your shelter story, she's a, a very good photographer, so she gets the dogs in these beautiful photos and, and helps promote, you know, right, that, that's the so important. Feed. And that's why, I mean, Pet Finder was genius too. I mean, you fall in love, these, you know, people look at these dogs, you fall in love with them. Uh, you know, recently I did a episode of a PBS series called Shelter Me. Yeah. And it's a series that goes to different shelters and tells positive stories about, you know, animal shelters. So they had me go to the New York City, the ACC of NYC, and spend two days there mm-hmm. and bring my notebook and then to do actual shelter story comics based on the, right. you know, the, the stories uh, there. The stories I saw. So here's New York City. Uh, boy, it's an, amaz- an amazing shelter. They're, they're open 24 mm-hmm. 7, and their adoption rate's 90%. It's really amazing. But um, going back to you know, Pet Finder and the internet, one of the stories I wrote about when I was there was a couple from from Maine saw a dog on their website and came down and to... drove to no, not was it Maine, it was Vermont, but yeah. still 
You know, yeah. you know she had someone from like Western Pennsylvania yeah. who came out to West Milford, New Jersey yeah, to, to they, you know. Came out to, they drove seven hours to New York City because they saw this dog on this site and fell in love with them. Yeah. So that's, it's that's great that your wife's taking photos of dogs. That really helps yeah. get the word out. Yeah. She asked me if I'd volunteer also and I told her I just, I can't. My, my, <laughs> I f- have far too much probably immature, uh, you know, feeling for, for animals that I would feel terrible anytime, you know things don't go well with one um but yeah it, it's one of those where i just like i i can't do it I, I would get too emotionally overwhelmed you know dealing with it so um so i'll stick to you know bringing in greyhounds and trying to be you know the, the the guy who keeps walking around with these strange alien looking dogs through the, the neighborhood <laughs> so you have um a couple of new books mm-hmm. either out or coming out uh that are all well you know dog and cat related in a sense. <laughs> um, the, the one that I, I just picked up last week, the um, a book of poems by Daniel Ladinsky that has your illustrations. Yeah. Would you have a, a history with working with him in the, the, the past? You could talk a little bit about the book and, and you know, yeah, I'll tell you, what well, it is. Um, well, Daniel Ladinsky is a, is a great poet. He's, he's well known for being a translator of Hafiz and Rumi. Mm-hmm. And, um, I just did a Rumi episode a couple of weeks oh, ago with the guy who just did the biography of Rumi, uh, Brad Gooch. It's a really wow. good one. I was going to wow, zap wow. it to you to zap to him. <laughs> yeah, so, I love this. Cool. You know, so I, I spend most of my downtime reading spiritual books, and Ladinsky's poems are just really great. He has, uh, I mean, one of his books is entitled I Heard God Laughing, <laughs> which is just a great title, and um, Love Poems from God I can totally recommend. Um, and... One of the reasons I loved his poetry was uh, that it did have a little bit of a sense of humor to it. And he did use animal imagery quite a bit. And um, I just loved his timing and just everything about him. And I felt an affinity with it. So, again, in my sketchbooks, there was one or two poems that just felt like little comics to me. So mm-hmm. I it was I naturally just I illustrated two or three of his poems in my sketchbook. Because they felt like comics. I, you know, I, in the introduction to the book, I mentioned that I, I think poetry, especially haikus, and these are haikus or kind of haikus. <laughs> he, I love Daniel. He took liberty. You know, yeah. they, they, they didn't have to follow all the rules. But um, you know, comic strips and poetry is similar, just because you know, you know, the haikus have their seventeen symbols, and I have syllables, and I have my three panels. You know, and it's real. I mean, less is more. With yeah. comic strips is like the big lesson as with poetry and haiku poetry. And I really do think it's about chipping away all the unnecessary stuff and just get to the heart of the matter. I mean, poetry does that, and I think good comic strips do that. Um, so it was a natural for me to illustrate his poems. And one of his poems, I kind of twisted up a little bit, and it became a, a, a Mutt Sunday page with Guard Dog. But I, I, it was enough of his words that I wanted to get his permission. So I sent it, to, I sent the comic to his publisher before I printed it and said, is this okay? And I got back, yeah, that was fine. So that appeared in the, in the papers. And then over the years, I started illustrating a few more of his poems. And I had enough that I said, you know, I'm going to take a chance and send him these and ask him if he'd be interested. And maybe we could do something with these. So I got his address from his publisher and mailed it to him. And uh, he, more than a year went by. And I kind of took it for granted I insulted the yeah. poet. <laughs> so what are you drawing <laughs> cartoons on my poems? Uh, but as it turns out, he was uh, a poet on the move. He just never stayed in one place. And he didn't get back to his house for a year. Yeah. But when he saw me, he liked them. And, and my idea was I was going to illustrate poems he already wrote. He must have had six, seven books out. But he wrote back and said, oh, I love these so much, I'll write you new poems about your Mutz characters. And I was just like, wow. <laughs> so he literally, I think he wrote over a thousand poems. I mean, you know, they're haikus, they're short yeah. poems. But he wrote, a, I mean, every day he would email me and he said, yeah. oh, here's a poem. And he, off the top of his head, he'd like send poems. So I just had a, before you know it, I had a pile of a lot, a lot of poems. And I picked out the ones I liked the best and we put this book together. So uh yeah, I'm really proud of it. I, it's a great little book. Cool. And you got an appearance with him. Well, uh, for anybody listening to this on no, a timely no, he manner. canceled. Oh, he canceled it. <laughs> yeah, oh, we were gonna geez. we were gonna talk in town, but uh, 
like I said, he's an elusive poet. He, uh, yeah. <laughs> he's back in the, the wilderness. <laughs> Understood. You mentioned um, an affinity for spiritual books. Yeah. How far back does that go for you? Or do you know what the roots of it are in your, your life? Because this is ostensibly a podcast about books and life, but really it's all over the place. But I was just wondering, <laughs> you know, do, do you see, was there a, a history or anything that led you down yeah, that Yeah, I'll tell uh, you two things. I think, believe it or not, I think it goes back to Peanuts. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as a kid, and, I, and I've said this before, but I always felt like if I could give back some of the joy and comfort that I got from yeah. Peanuts to the world, you know, that was that was my job. And in Peanut, I mean, that was kind of my religion when I was a kid. I, I, it wasn't only the great jokes and the great drawings and the great characters, but there was just a kindness and a spirituality underneath all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's true of all great art. Like I said, you know, as a cartoonist, you keep on chipping away until you get to the essence of something. And I think in life, if you keep on chipping away at anything, the essence is love. And I think, you know, what we love about the art we like is underneath all of that is just that universal power and spirit comes through. You know, the best artists are able to have that come through in their work. So I think my first spiritual readings were, you know, The Gospel I, of Charles Schultz. The Gospel of Charles Schultz. Before <laughs> I went to bed every night, I would read a wow. couple of Peanuts cartoons. As like, and I also see comics, at least this sounds corny, but uh, they're like little meditations and little prayers and um I think I've just figured out the fundamental difference between you and me. I was busy reading Gary Trudeau Doonesbury strips when I was a kid before going to bed. So <laughs> I ended up with this horrendously disillusioned, uh, you know, horrible world. Okay, now I understand well, you know, how we differ. This is so great. I love this show. This you know, uh, the things are different. You know, uh, you know, I love Gary Trudeau for what he does, but to me, that's all. Uh, that's all. You know. It was Current events, it's all head stuff. It's all yeah. ego. It was, it was the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, yeah, no, so exactly. I was a kid. That was, yeah. No, and again, it's great stuff, but it's just different stuff. I yeah. lean towards the more poetic stuff. So yeah. like Crazy Cat and, and Sparky spoke to me not only in their artistry, but I think in their, just the kindness that was underneath yeah. all of that stuff. Like that really, that really touched me. Um, and then I, I think, I forget that. I, boy, I have this book somewhere and I forget the name of it, but sometime when I was a teenager, there was this little pamphlet they sold in like hippie stores and it was Zen comics. Hmm. And I should know the artist, but right now I can't remember his name. But it was a little self-published comic with like two Buddhist priests that just said like little Zen cones, but they were yeah. comic strips. And that, that book was really, <laughs> yeah. I thought it was the greatest book in the world, but it definitely, it, it spoke impact. to me. Yeah, it, it, it for, spoke for the to time, me, the, it was... the simplicity of it and the fact that you know, there could be comics about spirituality. So, um, yeah, so I think Peanuts was probably my first spiritual book. <laughs> Understood. That's, um, you know, you brought grace into, to, you know, the comic that you do. Do you see anything, um, I shudder to ask, another 23 years of mutts? Um, <laughs> or is that a, a fate worse than death to, to, <laughs> to be wishing on you? You know, again, you take it one day at a, one yeah. day at a time. Um I mean, do you see Schultz's fifty years as something that? Oh you God, know, I don't. Boy, that's 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 scary to think about. Yeah. But again, when you do it one day at a time, who knows? You'll have to ask me in twenty six years. I'll be back. <laughs> but uh, but definitely, I mean, I, I, you know, the people who get to do this for a living, we're really blessed. And uh, you know, we mentioned Jules Pfeiffer, but God, I've had the opportunity recently to have dinner with Jules Pfeiffer and also have dinner with Al Jaffe. Al you know, he's yeah. 95 years old and is still doing what he's doing. You know, and I, most of, there's a lot of cartoonists, cartoonists that live a long time. And I, I think the reason is they have something to live for. You know, that, that creative energy just, I mean, every day you wake up and you can't wait to try. I mean, I mentioned Jules before. I mean, you know, I said he was inspiring because of how loose his work was, but he was, he's also inspiring, you know, all the different mediums he, yeah. he's been, you know, got movies, plays. I mean, that, that that's inspiring to me that just have that creative outlet and, you know, take a stab at all that stuff. And he did it so well. Yeah, everything he was great at. So that always makes me feel like, yeah, I can try a play. I can try a movie. Why not? Yeah. Um, but then more importantly, you know, he's now, you know, at, at how old is he now? 85, 87, 5, 86, there. whatever. And just started doing graphic novels and you know at the dinner he, you could tell he, he had more energy he he literally told me he felt like he was finally doing what he was supposed to do so to think at 86 but i could see that like i can't 
it with these paintings, like I have a whole new energy. I can't go to, can't wait to go in the studio and paint. I don't, you know, age isn't going to stop that, you know? So, so I think we're, we're really, I guess the secret is to, to do something you really like to do. Good wisdom. Patrick <laughs> McDonald, thanks so much for coming on the virtual memory oh, show. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. And that was Patrick McDonald. His comic strip, Mutz, is published daily in more than 700 newspapers. And you can also find it at mutz.com, M-U-T-T-S. Um, that'll have the current day strip as well as the previous two weeks worth. Um, there's a, there are a lot of collections of Mutz comics to enjoy, including the best of Mutz, which covered the first 10 years of the strip. Um, it's, it's a nice hardcover edition. It gives you a good sampling of how the, uh, the strip started out. Um, like I said during the episode, Mutz is one of the two best comic strips in the post-Calvin and Hobbes era, cul-de-sac being the other one. Um, visit mutz.com and check out not just the strip, but the huge body of work that Patrick's made over the years, the the work that he does for the Humane Society, the work that he does to, to get us to understand and, and care about the animals in our lives that much more. Um I do want to thank him and his wife, uh, both for showing us such hospitality. My wife came along on, on this one. Um, they gave us a nice tour of their home. Uh, my wife and, and Karen O'Connell spend, uh, the, the entire time talking while Patrick and I were recording. Um, they're good people. And they also, um, as I've alluded to, but did not talk about on the podcast much, we had to say goodbye to our, our, Greyhound Rufus T. Firefly Roth uh, back in December, and I've been pretty broken up about that for a while. And um, the conversation with, with Patrick and Karen really helped a lot in terms of understanding how to let go, um, what that process feels like, why, you know, why when it feels right, like we said during the episode, you should bring another animal into your home. If, if that's what you're, you're feeling and we're getting ready to do that, I'll fill you in, uh, whenever we have a, uh, a new, new member of the virtual memories family, I guess. Anyway, I just want to say this is a very special episode in a lot of different ways. Um, and I want to thank them again for, you know, taking us into their home. Oh, and Patrick did show me some of his paintings. We were recording in his, his painting studio. Um, sort of hoping some of them are somehow affordable when he decides to exhibit because there are some really gorgeous ones and and i would love to have some of these in my living room anyway uh like i said this one was recorded in the painting studio at patrick mcdonald's home in princeton uh there were no tolls to get down there no bridges or anything like that so it was just gas uh, a few bucks for parking at a garage off palmer square uh and a coffee over at rojo's Ro uh, roastery if you're ever in Princeton looking for a pick-me-up, a legal pick-me-up, um, they make a pretty good pour-over. So Rojo's Roastery, they're on Palmer Square. Uh, they're right next to a neat olive oil place, which makes my wife happy, too. So anyway, Princeton is just a wonderful, wonderful town to visit, and I'm, I'm glad we got to get down there. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee um, then visit patreon.com slash vms pod or paypal.me slash vms pod and make a one-time or recurring donation now, speaking of donors special thanks go out to paul w jones kevin katila michael janizic fred kish jonathan kranz andrew mason greg tanner zach martin craig p stefan and ron slate for going over and above in their support of the virtual memories show there's a full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down, although I did want to use Free the Animal by Shia, but I don't have the rights to do that. Uh, Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down is by David Bayerwald, and it's used with permission from the artist. David has a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David. They made the wonderful album Welcome to the Boomtown. You can find out more about the reunion and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Jessa Crispin, who will talk about how she has managed to publish three books since she was last on the show, making me feel like even more of a slacker. Till next time, 
You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for this podcast. And that'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. And you are awesome. Keep it that way.